Good morning, everyone. Whoa. Um, those of you who are new to SAR may never have been to one of these before. So two years ago, we started a program of discussion salons to follow the public lectures and occasionally for other events too. The idea being to give members a chance to dive deeper into the issues that are raised by the, um, by the previous day's lecture. Um, we're doing the same thing for the Doug Preston film showing next week and that should be fun. We'll have multiple participants there. Um, and we're also doing live streaming, which is why we use microphones. And when it comes to the Q&A part, uh, the, um, Lindsay will be the, uh, the angel who will bring a microphone. And please give it back to her when you're done. Um, so I also want to uh, do a shout out to our distant viewers, one of whom is my daughter, Emily Brown, at Hobart College in upstate New York, uh, and then unknown others. So this is a new thing for us, and it's a little more sophisticated than just a straight, you know, video. We've got multiple cameras. It feeds, if, if we were doing a PowerPoint, which in this case we're not, that would also be fed in. So, and it's live, uh, and then, then it goes right to YouTube where it can be viewed later on. So this is something new, and I, I want to thank uh, Meredith Schweitzer for, and, and Garrett um, Freeland up there for, for doing the technology, because it's really, really working great. Anyway, I'm delighted to introduce, or for some of you, reintroduce uh, Thomas Malone. Tom's the McGovern Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management and the founding director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence, uh, of which I gather this, this group is an example. Um, Previously was founder and director of the MIT Center of Coordination Science and uh, one of two founding directors of another center, or sorry, an initiative called Inventing the Organizations of the 21st Century. Um, Tom is a native of Artesia, New Mexico. Uh, he went to Rice University, received his PhD from Stanford, um, was a research scientist at Xerox Park, which many of you know is a kind of storied research center in the Bay Area. Uh, and he is the author of two important work, uh, works. One is called The Future of Work and his newer book, Superminds, which we heard uh, about last night. So the format um, is that Tom will just do a brief summary for those of you who weren't there, give you a sense of what his main argument is, then we open it up for questions and um, probably go for 75 minutes, something like that, and then we can just turn off the equipment and go to more informal discussion, keeping in mind that our speaker also has uh, a plane to catch uh, early afternoon in Albuquerque. Tom. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, actually, I, I recognize a lot of faces from last night, so let me just take a show of hands. How many of you heard my, my talk last night? How many of you did not hear my talk last night? Okay, two people did not hear it. Um, I guess I'm inclined to do a really quick summary for the two of you, and the others of you may find it interesting to hear a sort of shorter version. Does that sound re reasonable? Okay, so uh, I started last night by giving two main messages from my book, Superminds. The first is that I think we're spending too much time thinking about people, and, people or computers, and not enough time thinking about people and computers. Too much time, for instance, thinking about how many jobs computers are taking away from people, and not enough time thinking about what people and computers can do together that could never be done before. So that's the first message. The second message is about a new way of looking at the world, a way of seeing ghosts all around us. These ghosts are superminds, which I define as groups of individuals acting together in ways that at least sometimes seem intelligent. So these ghosts really are all around us. Every company, every democracy, uh, every labor union, every uh, labor market, uh, every scientific community, every neighborhood, everyone in this room, these are all groups of superminds. So if you look at the world that way, you realize that these supermind ghosts run our world. Almost everything we humans have ever accomplished was done by groups of people, not individuals acting all alone. So those are the two messages. I want to also make two other quick points tonight, which summarize kind of the rest of the talk. Uh, the first is there are five important types 
of these superminds, at least superminds for making decisions. And actually, I think Meredith made copies of my slide from last night about that. If you want to just pass those around. Uh, we didn't want to set up a slide projector this morning, but uh, now you have a copy of it on paper if you want. Uh, the, um, the five types, I think it's worth giving you the definitions of those five types. The first and most obvious type of supermind for decision making is a hierarchy, where group decisions are made by delegating them to individuals in the group. The second type of supermind for making decisions is a democracy, where group decisions are made by voting. The third is a market, where the group decisions are really the combination of a whole lot of pairwise agreements between individual buyers and sellers. And the fourth is a community where the group decisions are made by a kind of informal consensus based on shared norms and reputations. All four of those types of superminds involve some amount of cooperation among the group members. But if there's no cooperation among the group members, then you have the fifth kind of supermind, which I call ecosystems. In an ecosystem, the group decisions are made by the law of the jungle. Whoever has the most power gets what they want and the survival of the fittest. So those are the five types. We can talk a lot more about that, but I think that's a, a language for thinking about how to design superminds that explains much of what we see in the world around us and that gives us a systematic way of thinking about how we might do things differently. So that's the five types. The other key uh, message I tried to convey last night was that computers can make superminds smarter. They don't always do that. Fake news affecting voters in a democracy is an example of the opposite. But I think computers can make superminds much smarter. I think Wikipedia is a great example of that. There are lots and lots of other examples all around us. But I think it's important to realize two things about how computers can make superminds smarter. The first is that we probably overemphasize the potential of artificial intelligence, at least in the near to medium term. People have been asking for, well, many people think that we'll have human level AI in the next 20 years or so. But people have been trying to predict when we'd have human level AI ever since the beginning of the field of artificial intelligence. And for the last 60 years, people have been saying, we'll have human level AI in about 20 years. So I think it's unlikely, not theoretically impossible, but unlikely that this time they'll be right. I think it's likely to be many, many decades before we have human level AI. But in the meantime, in fact already, computers are already much better than people at some things. So they don't have to be equal to or better than people at everything to be very useful. What I think we'll use computers for increasingly and AI in particular, is doing specialized tasks. And people will use their general intelligence to do the other things that need to be done. But, and I, but I think we overestimate the potential of AI uh, in part because it's so easy for us to imagine human level artificial intelligence. Our science fiction is full of that. But it's, very, it's much harder to actually create that than to imagine it. On the other hand, I think we underestimate the potential of something else computers can do, which is to help create what I call hyper-connectivity, connecting people to other people and also to computers at scales and in rich new ways that were never possible before. So uh, I think we underestimate that in part because it's probably easier to create hyper-connectivity than to imagine it. We've created massively hyper-connected groups on the internet with billions of people connected. Uh, but it's hard for us to even imagine what that can do today, much less what it will do in the future. So those are the main points I made last night. I gave a bunch of examples and some implications, but hopefully that's a good summary to start our conversation today. I'd like to kick off with a sort of inevitable anthropology question. I was thinking about your talk last night. And in, in some ways, 
it seems to me, bracketing the question of artificial intelligence and computers, that the whole rise of our species is based on social interaction, the whole of the community whole being greater than some of the parts. So does that qualify as a kind of basic form of supermind in your case? Or are you talking about absolutely. something? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, as an anthropologist, you know very well that the vast majority of time we humans have been on this planet, we lived in small groups, which anthropologists often call bands. Uh, those are an example of the fourth type of supermind, which I call community. So that's the basic, well, in some sense, ecosystem is the most foundational kind of supermind because everything on the planet, all, all living things are in some sense competing in a kind of ecosystem for who has the most power to make different kinds of decisions about how the planet's resources will be used. So that's the most foundational thing. But among humans, the foundational type of supermind is a community. And we lived in small communities of about a couple of dozen people or so, 10, 15, 50 at the most maybe, uh, for most of our history. And it's only fairly recently that we've developed these other types of superminds, democracies, markets, and hierarchies. And a lot of that is driven by scale, and so that you reach a point, I don't know how much your book talks about that, but there are just limits to how much face-to-face -face decision making you can have once you get above, I don't know, I'm not sure what the magic number is, 500, 1,000, and then things tend to sort into hierarchies to some extent. Yes. Um, that's part of the, the genius of our species, is that we have developed ways of organizing human groups at larger and larger scales in more and more effective ways. But even before we did that, even at the size of the hunter-gatherer bands of a couple dozen people, say, uh, you can make a very good case. In fact, um, uh, Yuval Hariri makes this case in his book, Sapiens, and I drew heavily on that in the first chapter of my book. Uh, that the thing that separates humans from all the other animals on our planet is not that individual humans are so much smarter. They probably are, but that alone wouldn't do you much good when you're going up against a mad saber-toothed tiger or a lion or whatever. Just being smarter doesn't help that much. What helps is working with other people in coordinated ways that really can defeat the lions and the tigers and all the other hazards in our environment around us much better than we could as individuals. So in some sense, it's not just our cognitive intelligence that makes we humans the leading uh, animals on the planet, the top of the food chain, so to speak. It's not just our cognitive intelligence, it's our social intelligence, our ability to work with other people, to do things in groups, and larger and larger groups are often better and better for many of these things that allow us to dominate the planet in the way we have, actually both for good and for ill. Uh, but I think that's, that's a key insight of the perspective of superminds. It's really human superminds that dominate the planet, not individual humans. spoke about the synthesis of these four kinds of superminds to create a highly optimized, very inventive uh, collaboration that could do large-scale decision-making at the policy level for almost an arbitrary organization or community. Could you speak to that? Yeah, um, so I, I think you're talking about my example with strategic planning, yes. but it also in some sense applies to the climate collab example as well. Um, uh, for the couple of you who weren't there last night, the uh, climate collab example was about how we've done a project at MIT where we're crowdsourcing the problem of what to do about global climate change. In fact, let me analyze that using the superminds. I'm going to kind of do this on the spur of the moment, but I think I can make it work. Uh, the, um, the climate collab is in some sense a set of contests which are in a certain sense markets. So we, as the organizers of those contests, are the customers, and we're asking lots of people to uh, compete for the business of 
winning prizes in these different contests about the different sub-problems, like how can you gener generate electricity with fewer emissions, or how can you reduce emissions from transportation and so forth. So th in some sense, that's a market at root. But there's also clearly a hierarchy involved because we designed this, we made the contests available, we selected the judges who used their authority uh, delegated by us to select the winners. So it's, there's a hierarchy involved there, clearly. Uh, in Climate Collab, I didn't say this last night, but one of the other interesting things we do is to have two kinds of prizes in each of the contests or challenge areas. We have a judge's choice winner, determined in that hierarchical way, but we also have a people's choice or popular choice winner de decided by anyone registered as part of the community to vote on which ones they think are best. Uh, we learned an interesting lesson, by the way, the very first year we did this, where we let anyone put in a proposal and anyone vote, and the winning proposal that year was one that said, okay, let's reduce all our emissions by 97% in the next 10 years or something to that effect something that every expert said is, is just really not even remotely possible. So what we did after that was use the judges, again, a kind of hierarchical process, to select finalists, about five or so finalists in each contest, and then we let the judges pick a judge's choice winner and the, and the community pick a popular choice winner among those things. So that's democracy, hierarchy, and markets you've seen. In some sense, the whole thing is about a community. So we call it the Climate Collab Online Community uh, because in some sense the community is solving problems that they are interested in. There's a sort of community norms about it would be good to do something sensible about climate change and so forth. So uh, in that sense, the Climate Collab involves all of those different types of superminds. Uh, the other example I talked about was the uh, strategic planning example where a big company, but you're exactly right, this could be used by almost any kind of group to come up with policies, could use different kinds of superminds. I won't go through the exact examples again, but prediction markets and contest webs and what I call hyper uh, learning loops, uh, super cyber human learning loops, etc. Uh, they could use that to generate options, to evaluate the options, to gather and analyze data to help do that better. All those kinds of things could be done by, by anything, uh, any group. Um, let me give you one other example, which is how our whole societies are organized. Uh, and by the way, the, there's a general point here, which is that even though I presented the five superminds as distinct things that seem like they're alternatives, in most of the cases in the world, you see combinations of those. Like I just described with Climate Collab, let me describe now how our society works. To a first approximation, you could say that our modern Western democratic capitalist societies are organized on the basis of those different types of superminds kind of supervising one over another. So at the root is our communities, our, our uh, communities, our national, local, state, et cetera, communities want to get things to work well, but they can't make all the decisions themselves. When a community gets too big, you can't just have an informal consensus about everything that we should do. We can't all agree on how much uh, bacon Michael can have for breakfast tomorrow morning and how many apples you get to eat tomorrow afternoon. It's just way too much work for us to come to a consensus on all that. So over time, we've ended up delegating a lot of those decisions to markets. So people who raise apples and make bacon and so forth sell them to people who want to eat those things. And that market is pretty good at allocating resources. In fact, that's one of the things markets are really good at in ways that everyone involved essentially agrees to. You don't engage in any market transaction unless both the buyer and seller agree. Uh, but markets, don't always do the things you would want. Sometimes, for instance, uh, people cheat each other in markets. They say they'll do something and they don't, or they lie, or they do other kinds of things like that. Or uh, in bigger scales, you have monopolists and uh, other market failures like that. And markets also don't 
always allocate the resources in ways we would want them allocated. They may give too much money to some people and too little to others. So what we as a community decided to do was to let governmental hierarchies oversee those markets. So if you uh, have a, a market failure, like somebody signs a contract saying they'll do something and then they don't do it, you don't have to resort to the ecosystem method of beating them up till they do it. Uh, what you do is sue them in a court of law or something equivalent to that. So you have the, the legal, the judicial hierarchy to oversee those markets. But who's going to oversee the government? For many, many years, we had kings or emperors who oversaw the governments that performed those services. But uh, in the last few hundred years, many of us have come to believe that we don't really like the idea of a, a dictator or a king make, having the final authority on everything. So we said, let's choose who the king is. And then the king can delegate that power further to do what needs to be done. Uh, but we can't really use a consensus in a community to decide who the king's going to be. That's too blunt an instrument to make such a fine-grained choice. So we have come to use, in countries like this one, democracies through which the members of the community express their opinions in ways that may not be consensus, that is, not everyone agrees who should be the king, uh, but democracy is a pretty good way of making decisions even when it's pretty close, but there's at least some difference in the vote, that's a way of choosing the kings, or the, in this case, the leaders of the hierarchically organized government. So that's kind of a long way of saying that we all live in a combination of superminds where communities supervise democracies, which supervise governmental hierarchies, which super supervise markets, which fulfill most of our material needs. Does that make sense? I, I guess let me just say one other thing, which is that um, I think one of the very interesting possibilities is, uh, is for us to design new kinds of superminds, especially new kinds of superminds made possible using technology. And I think the five types that we just talked about give you a more precise language for doing that. It's kind of a design language, a set of pieces that you can put together in different ways to design new kinds of superminds. Does that make sense? Great. Uh, so in your book, you talked about the horseless carriage. And, it, it's, and that analogy has struck me for a long time about automation. So I'm, I'm very much with you, and I think your design idea is very powerful. But part of me wonders if we're thinking in horseless carriage terms about all of this. And just as horseless carriage designers, when they got the engine, designed it as if there was a carriage, and then as you pointed out, once you realized it could go a long way and it could go fast, you had to enclose it. The early controls were nothing like they were today. And it occurs to me that right now you have a supermind operating. I'm struck by the idea of people owning their data mm -hmm. and, and the fundamental difference that would make in the way that data is used, if we could actually track that. And it occurs to me that there might be something more like a, like a biological neural net or something like that, that, w w that when we look back on it, with all due respect to you and everybody else that's writing on this, all of us, um, will it, you know, is it possible that we're at the horseless carriage stage and all of these different things that we're talking about made sense before you had massive amounts of information that were computable and all that sort of thing, and that the future might look as different from what we think is the way humans organize today as the horseless carriage looked for modern automobiles. Uh, I think there's a great deal of truth to what you're saying. In fact, I've said things kind of like that in a few places in the book and more recently. Uh, uh, the, what, what I'm taking away, or what I, I think the implication of what you're saying is Maybe there's some whole new types of superminds, not just the five that I have on the page there, but some whole new ones. Like, you, you may have been implying this. I'm not sure if you meant it the way I'm about to say it, but I'm going to say a very explicit possibility, which is that... I'm sure it would be much smarter than I did. Oh, I'm not sure of that, but uh, I think one very intriguing possibility 
which I've written about in some recent proposals, I don't remember if I put it in the book or not, is that maybe there's something like a neural net where the nodes are not neurons but people. Yes. That, okay, so you meant that too. That, I think it's a really intriguing idea. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. So um, I absolutely do not think that these five types are the final word on everything. I think it's a very useful step to formalize these five which I think do account for very much of what we see in the world around us. And I think just as uh, cars still have many of the characteristics of carriages, like they've got usually four wheels and places to sit and stuff like that, I think the future things we invent will still have many elements that can be explained by the five things I talked about. But I think that it's quite possible we may in the future come to realize there are some new things not yet on that list of five that we eventually realize have become as important as some of those five. So I think it's a great point. So oh. you mentioned last night, you mentioned Apple Computer. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you to examine that more in light of your statement that accomplishments are made by groups of people or groups of computers and people working together. And particularly Apple Computer and Steve Jobs' place in that. So I think he was doing things that people around him probably saw as strange, not rational. So a related, perhaps different question, but related I think is how do your models account for irrationality for the irrational mind or the doing things very different mind like Steve Jobs was doing? Well, first let me answer the question I thought you were going to ask and you didn't quite ask it. Uh, uh, the question you might have asked was, uh, you, Tom, have been saying that super minds are what accomplishes things, not individuals, and yet when we look at the history of Apple, it appears that Steve Jobs had a huge role in all that. Uh, that's kind of the Steve Jobs question, which I often get. Uh, in a certain sense, you could say Steve Jobs is the exception that proves the rule, uh, because he did, in fact, have a huge influence on Apple. But I think there's a deeper point here, which is, if you really imagine Steve Jobs all by himself, he couldn't have done much of anything. He only accomplished things because he was able to catalyze actions of a vastly larger number of people than himself. And he was really good at that. One of his greatest talents, you might argue, was his charismatic ability to mobilize employees, to attract customers. He was remarkably good at that. The people I know who knew him, I did meet him myself once, by the way, when he spoke at MIT. Uh, but other people I know who knew him better than I did, I never got the impression they thought he was any kind of brilliant person in terms of technology or, or even really design, though he presented himself as a, an artist of a certain sort. Uh, but what I think everybody who knew him believes he was brilliant at is what you could call marketing. He was brilliant at understanding in some intuitive way what people wanted and how to convince them to, to want it even more when it was available to them. So he was brilliant at that. But I think, again, he, he really didn't do it by himself, not even remotely. I think we humans, especially in our Western culture, I think we have a tendency to attribute things to individuals that are actually the result of groups work. Uh, if, if an army wins a war, we say Dwight Eisenhower won the war, not thousands and thousands of soldiers in the whole hierarchy of the army won the war, and the latter is, of course, the truth. If we say Donald Trump uh, revamped U.S. immigration policy, uh, 
it wasn't just one individual, though that one really did have a lot of influence, but it was lots of people uh, that accomplished things, good or bad. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but my impression is that Eastern cultures do less of what we do a lot in the West of attributing things to individuals instead of to groups. So in part, uh, my saying at the beginning that I wanted to help us learn how to see ghosts uh, was to say that it really is a matter of how you look at the world. You can look at the world with the preconceived notion that most important things are due to individuals and you can see the world, you can interpret the world that way, but you can also look at the world by saying that most important things are due to groups. And I think we don't do that enough. I think that uh, there's a lot of things we can see if we look at the world that way that are very useful to see. Tom, even Steve Jobs had failures. He had to answer to the market and certainly mid-career he had some no notorious failures. So how, how, does that, how does failure of superminds tie into your argument? Um, I'd say the analogy of intelligence works pretty well here. Uh, if you think about intelligence in an individual human, you can be very smart and still make mistakes. In fact, everyone, no matter how smart they are, makes mistakes. And just because some entity, whether it's an individual or a group, makes mistakes or doesn't do the most optimal thing or whatever, doesn't mean they're not smart. It just means they're not perfect. And so, um, uh, you know, Steve Jobs as an individual and Apple as a company, they certainly made mistakes. And uh, in, in the long run, people are judged by the ultimate outcomes of things. But actually, in the long run, people are judged by outcomes, people and groups are judged by outcomes that depend on many things other than their own efforts. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but the older I get, the more I believe that luck plays a much more important role in many things in my life and in the world than I used to think. So I think that's another attribution failure we in the current society right now make. We attribute too little to luck relative to what it actually is. Does that make sense? Um, I just last night we discussed a little bit about how at the Sloan School you're doing work in corporate strategic planning and so forth. Well, now I want to bring to our attention, I think, a real challenge, which I think uh, this crowd thinking can contribute to, if I may. If you follow the business media, oh, like CNBC on TV, almost every day now they're talking about the new business model. We're not just working for shareholders, we're working for stakeholders. Now, when I ran a corporation, which I did for the good of my shareholders, it's fairly easy for me to figure out what to do next to make them happy. But now if I was the CEO and somebody said, well, now you have to pay attention to improving the environment. You have to pay attention to alleviating the conditions of poor, and so on and so on. That's not so easy, at least if I was looking at financial statements and so on. So we need some help. Uh, like Mark Benioff, you know, of Salesforce.com, the biggest company in San Francisco. He's talking about this every day. But as a practical matter, how do you do it? How do you quantify the priorities in being a good guy corporation? Can your crowd, wisdom of the crowd, help in that regard? Potentially. Um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. There's a whole bunch of things to say about this. Uh, one is it's not a new thing to be saying that corporations are responsible to more than just their shareholders. Uh, there are kind of phases in this. Um, uh, back in the 90s, I guess it was, there was a lot of talk about stakeholder capitalism and a lot of people were saying like things like what you just quoted, this recent group of executives have agreed to. Uh, Around the end of the 90s, the early 2000s, uh, we entered a phase where the companies and the groups like 
Business Roundtable, I think. That's the one that just said it recently. I think they said the same thing about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, and then they changed their mind for a while, and now they're saying it again. I don't know if it's the same exact group, but it's a similar kind of group. Um, so these things go in and out of fashion. I actually wrote uh, a fair amount about this in the last chapter of my book, The Future of Work, um, where uh, I talked about Milton Friedman, who has one of the most famous expressions of this, where he says the business of business is business, basically. That he said the, the, the uh, managers of a company should be responsible to its owner's interests, and in most cases that means maximizing profit. Let the owners uh, give their money away if they want to, but don't do it yourself on their behalf. Um, uh, in my book there, I, I basically talk about some flaws in that reasoning. It's not that it's always wrong, but I think it's uh, very limited. Uh, he assumes that the only thing the owners care about is maximizing their profits. But in fact, all owners are humans, and no human I've ever met cares only about money. At the minimum, you care about having oxygen and food and water and things like that. And if you, no matter how much money you have, if it's not gonna get you those things, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, and many humans care about a lot of other things like their fellow humans. And in fact, even empirically in the financial markets, uh, there is a significant fraction of money. When I looked into it back in 2004 or so, it was, I think, around 20% of the assets under management uh, were in socially responsible investment vehicles of some sort or another. So it's empirically true that some significant fraction of people want their money to be invested in ways that take into account more than just their economic return. So uh, what I talked about in Future of Work was what I called the marketplace for values. And I think this is at least one way of beginning to resolve the problem you're talking about. If you know that all you're supposed to do is maximize economic return, that gives you a way of concentrating on certain things. But if you know that what you need to do is appeal to the interests of your owners, whether those are economic or other or something else, that also gives you a way of focusing your attention. More complex, perhaps, but not impossible. Uh, because you can say, uh, some companies can say, in fact, some companies do today say, our goal is not to maximize our profit or our shareholder return. Our goal is to do something else. Like for many years, Johnson & Johnson was famous for their credo, where they talked about, I think, patients first and employees next, et cetera, and then shareholders were last. Um, that credo served them very well for many years. In recent years, uh, it seems to have been changing how they apply that. Uh, but that was responsible, for instance, for the, um, the Tylenol, the way the Tylenol thing was handled back in the 90s or 80s. When they did that, we now think of it as, oh, that's obviously the right thing to do. But at the time they did that, they, th they had reason to believe they were doing something that was a very bad economic move but that it was the right thing to do according to their credo. As it turned out, doing it gave them huge credibility with their customers and lots of other people. And so in the long run, it probably was even a good thing to do economically. But I don't think they did it for that reason. And I think uh, it's certainly possible for companies like J&J, &J, Google that says don't do evil, lots of other companies have done this. It's possible for a company to say, we're, we're interested in other things besides just shareholder economic return, and people who don't want to invest in that don't have to. People who do can. And so there's kind of a marketplace, a competitive marketplace for what, if any, non-economic values does a particular company say they are going to pursue. And if they find other people who want to invest in them under those grounds, fine. If they don't, then they go out of business or change their mind. So I think that's at least one way of reconciling the issue. And I think it, it's also important to realize that corporations are human creations. We humans, in a democracy in this country, decided we were gonna let people come together in groups and create limited liability corporations. That's a good deal. It makes investors, it's better for investors than a partnership or other things in many ways. Um, 
Uh, and so that's something that the company gets from the society, from the government in this case. And if the society or the community thinks that they should be able to get something, some other benefits from letting corporations enjoy the legal benefits they have, then I think it's perfectly uh, legal and acceptable for a community and a government to require that. Does that make sense? Can, I've got to say, though, you know, there is a powerful argument against conferring um, legal personhood to corporations. I saw a bumper sticker recently that cracked me up. It said, I'll believe that corporations are persons when te Texas executes one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, uh, you know, so there uh, obviously the the uh, there are aspects of corporate personhood that are, as you say, very useful, but there's a dark side to that too. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think the objection to legal personhood is based uh, primarily on the Citizens United decision, yes. right? So, in fact, I'm arguing something even stronger than legal personhood for corporations. I'm arguing for supermindhood of all kinds of groups, corporations, markets, communities, all kinds of things. And, and so I think in a certain sense, there's nothing wrong with having legal personhood for certain things of corporations. I do happen to personally believe, as I suspect many other people in this room do, that Citizens United was probably a bad idea, uh, not because it treated corporations as legal persons, but because it gave political power to an entity that isn't a human person and could have vastly more, what, what it actually does was, the, its effect is to give vastly more political power to people who have more money, which I think is not what democracies are usually intended to do. And so I think that's the mistake, not legal personhood, but political power through ability to make campaign contributions. Actually, I, I know you've had your hand up about five times and nobody gave you a microphone, so I'm going to ask if we can let Steve go next. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I got a couple of questions, <laughs> but I talked with you a little bit about uh, collaborative decision making and the environmental debrief and uh, things that a friend of mine that I've done a little bit of. The, go and the thought of it in that area is uh, the people that are impacted by whatever decision it is you're going to make are the ones who make the decision. And if you don't get their consensus, or at least something pretty close to consensus, it's not going to happen. You know, no matter what the best decision is in some ideological way, uh, without agreement, there is none. And then I was looking at your, uh, you know, your, your ghost hierarchy. So there's a decision maker. Ecosystems, decisions are made by brute force. Or, so, how does the how does implementing the decision uh, play into all of this? Or so, does it? Well, of course it does. I, I think you're saying even if a group decides something, but it doesn't actually happen because nobody's going to implement it. What good does that do, basically? seems to me that there needs to be, at some point, I'm not criticizing by any means, but there'd be another dimension to this implementation and practice. Yeah. So um, uh, I think it's a very important point that you're raising. Uh, in a certain sense, I guess I'd say that if people decide things that don't get implemented, then they really didn't decide them. You know, if you just say, oh, well, uh, 
I, Tom Malone, am deciding that uh, U.S. troops will be withdrawn from Afghanistan, that's not really a decision. That's an expression of opinion or preference, but it's not a decision unless it actually has force in, in implementation. So uh, I think the one way of interpreting the question is to say there are lots of ways we could potentially make decisions, but some of them aren't effective decision-making methods because they don't, the, the so-called decisions don't actually get implemented. And so a very important dimension to consider in evaluating alternative ways of making decisions is which of those ways are likely to lead to decisions that actually get implemented. And you talked at the beginning of your, your question about uh, saying that uh, all the people affected by a decision should be involved in making it, otherwise they won't go along with it and it won't actually get implemented. That's sometimes true, but not always. Um, uh, the kinds of decisions you're talking about, I think, are difficult public policy decisions in democracies, basically. And it is often the case that even if some governmental authority says we're going to do X, but nobody in the community agrees with it, uh, it may not actually work, may not actually happen the way anybody expected it to. So, but, but there are certainly cases where decisions get made that affect lots of people who aren't involved in the decision making. You know, a good example might be the army. You know, the, the generals don't consult all the privates who are going to go out on the battlefield before making the decision, even though some of those privates are going to be very affected by the decision. So uh, I think what you started with is not a, a, tr a truth that's universally true. It's just a description of some situations which are important. And in those situations, it is important to involve the people who are going to be affected by the decisions if their, if their cooperation is in some sense needed for the decision to be in, implemented. Right. Well, that, that's actually one of the virtues of democracy. If you're in a community, you can only do the things that most people agree on as a community, you said that, and I think it's very true. But there are lots of things that you don't get anything close to a near consensus about, but we still have to somehow decide. And one of the great strengths of democracies, if people agree to participate in a democracy, that is to honor the decision that's made, whatever it is, one of the great strengths is that groups that are far from unanimity can still make in decisions that they will abide by uh, if they agree to go with the majority or some other proportion of the vote then even the people who are unhappy with how the election came out will still say yes he's still my president or whatever the decision is um, uh, so I think that's that's one way of making these decisions and the methodologies you were talking about before we started and we're referring to in your question I think are uh, ways of getting even closer to a consensus than a democracy, which is desirable but not always possible. So to follow up on the gentleman's uh, comments about corporate social responsibility, I think that has to do as much about recruiting and a generational shift that when you see, like if you look at the early 90s, that was Gen X coming into the marketplace and to recruit somebody to an old stodgy Fortune 500 company, you needed to reverse the thing and give them some pride in working and, and joining the team. And I think Salesforce is, uh, and, and these new companies are re realizing that, uh, that millennials just won't work for GE, right? You know, just because GE is a, this big conglomerate, but, but, you know, show that they're contributing back to the society. Um, and that's a comment. Uh, the question I had was, I really like the idea of uh, liquid democracy, but I, th I think that there's a, a risk to the lack of merit put into it. And so I've always kind of believed in meritocracy as democracy. It's like you contribute, you show that you understand, you're recent, you have a domain experience, and so create a qualified set of tiers to allow people to, to know, because in a liquid democracy, Trump would still be president. I mean, if he, he had the cult of personality at the time and was able to get enough people to advocate their vote to people. So how to create, like, this guy's an idiot, he shouldn't be qualified. So a qualified democracy that allows people to then sift through this and allow people to be more knowledgeable and, and know about domain experience. 
Yeah. Um, let me say something that's related to what you ask, and if I didn't kind of get the heart of your question, please follow up. Uh, but one of the things I talk about in, the, in my book, in Superminds, is two different kinds of democracy. We often kind of blur the two, but it's useful, I think, to make a distinction between voting for facts and voting for values. The super forecasters example I used last night was an, I called it a democracy, even though it's not literally voting. People made their probability estimates and those probability estimates got combined by a, an algorithm uh, that, that basically weighted the votes on the basis of how accurate people had been in the past, how recently they'd made their predictions and several other factors. So that's, you could call it a weighted democracy where some votes count a lot more than others and those votes may, uh, the weightings may depend on how qualified people are to express an opinion about this topic, whatever it is. In, a, in cases where you're voting for, to determine facts, that's often a very good idea, one that's underexploited, I think. I think there are lots of things we could do with weighted voting to determine the truth about, or to estimate the truth about things. And I think there's lots of opportunity to think about that. Another kind of voting is voting for values. You know, is it more important to us to have more uh, material goods available in general, or is it more important to us to have whatever amount we have equally distributed? There's no kind of logically correct answer to that question. It's really a value question. Uh, and there are many, many other things like that. Most real decisions involve a combination of facts and values. Um, if you, even if you know all, if you're trying to make decisions on the basis of incorrect perceptions of the facts, I could, you could call it incorrect sensing, you're gonna make a lot of bad decisions. But even if you have all the facts correct, people can still differ on what the right decision is because they differ on what values we should be trying to achieve. But I think the kind of the implication of this, which I kind of threw away at the end of my democracy chapter, I didn't go too far with it, but I think it's, it's something that's worth exploring in much more detail, which is, could we really do that more? Could we separate voting for facts and voting for values? So uh, I guess I'm gonna try to apply it to the example you gave. Uh, maybe you should let one group of voters who are qualified to assess candidates' capabilities vote on who's capable of performing the job. That's kind of like what we did with the judges in Climate Colab determining the finalists. We said, we're not gonna let everybody vote on everything because some people frankly don't have enough information to make some sensible choices. So maybe one group of voters heavily weighted for people who are good at doing this, assess the qualifications of candidates and figure out who's, who's a viable candidate. And then another group of voters says, okay, given that these are all kind of capable, I'm gonna vote for the ones who I think will, will support the things I care about. Um, so that actually, as I say it, I think that, that does sound like kind of an intriguing possibility. I don't think it's likely to be implemented anytime soon, <laughs> but, uh, Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the values part of it. Yeah. You vote for the things that are consistent with your interests, however you define that. Maybe selfish interests or you believe that we should be good to other people and you vote for that value. Either way, it's kind of values. Um, but that's why when you ask for it, it's on that. Yeah. Right. As a last, uh, so you cited Jim Rutt as uh, on that slide yesterday. Have you discussed this with? Is he like one of the leading thinkers in uh, liquid democracy? Um, I don't know if there is enough of a community of liquid democracy to say that anybody is a, a leading thinker. But uh, I certainly found his material, I believe it's on Medium, uh, wherever it was I found it. I found it very well written, very useful, 
uh, and so I cited it. Uh, I gather you may know him. He actually has connections to Santa Fe. Uh, he was the pre uh, board chair at the Santa Fe Institute and uh, is here. I've seen him give a really great uh, lecture where he starts off with sort of like throw the baby out with the bath. Like he starts with shoot the puppy. I don't know if you've ever seen this <laughs> lecture, but no. it was the cutest little golden retriever with a 357 pointed at his head and you start with that and it's the shock of we've got a lot of good things that are cute and pretty, but we need to uh, always reassess. And yeah. so it's, uh, I've, I've never met him. Uh, if you know him, tell him I'd like to talk to him. Uh, I think he is a S MIT graduate and I've thought about just sending him a cold email, but haven't done that yet. I, uh, I don't know if I can actually connect you, but I'll try. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I had a couple uh, questions, but one thing I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately is uh, over the last three or four years, um, you know, both NSF and I've seen it in science and other places talk about either a total science or convergence. And one thing they're referring to is that whatever the big challenges might be in, in our world that we want to uh, think about as being relevant to all of us. Uh, there are little clusters of researchers here and there working on these things. Maybe different disciplines have different approaches to it. And so they're proposing that, it seems very obvious, let's bring the best thinking to the biggest problems, wherever it may occur, whatever discipline it's in. And so I'm wondering um, if you have some comments about if we were con to construct uh, research teams that we're going to address the biggest challenges on the planet, let's say climate change, or whatever we might beside, beside uh, species loss, uh, inequality, um, whatever uh, poverty, all of these things, and we wanted it to be relevant to the planet and our success on the planet. Um, how might we construct a research team uh, that also includes the super Super mind? Uh, yeah, super mind kind of approach. And I think you hinted at some of those things last night. Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful question. I think it would be really exciting and hugely good for the world to do what you just said. Uh, it would be a super mind by definition if we did that. It's not that you have to bring super mind to it. It would already be a super mind. But uh, to bring super mind thinking to it would be a question of, how can we design such a supermind in a way that is as intelligent as possible for the goals of solving whatever problems it's working on? Um, uh, let, me, let me make several comments. One is science today is organized in ways that more and more people are coming to believe are not optimal. Um, for one thing, it is very siloed, and that has the same problem that silos in, in companies have. You get a whole bunch of people who are very focused on one particular question, which is good to know about, whether it's manufacturing or marketing or whatever, but to really make a profit, you have to bring together the different silos. You have to figure out what customers want to buy, design something that will meet those characteristics, make it in a cost-effective way, and convince people to buy it for a price that gives you a profit. So that requires communication, coordination across the different functional silos that are too strong in many companies. Um, it's interesting to say, by the way, that other ways of organizing just create different silos. Uh, so you can have silos on functions or silos on products or whatever, and you almost always need coordination in whatever other dimensions you didn't focus the silos on. So uh, that's one way of saying a key question for an effective supermind of the type you described to solve scientific, uh, to bring to bear scientific and potentially other knowledge on solving important problems uh, would need to figure out how to manage the coordination in many ways. Um, uh, Loosely speaking, the best way of organizing that would probably be something like what's called an ad hocracy. In other words, not a fixed, rigid hierarchy, 
but a much looser kind of network where people who have the requisite skills come together to solve different sub-problems in ways that are quickly changeable and easily coordinated. Uh, that's at least a first thought about how to organize such a thing. But I think, uh, I think it's a really interesting question. I think the question, uh, in some sense, the big, one of the biggest questions would be, who's going to provide the resources that would provide enough incentives for this to happen? Uh, most scientists today work in universities where there's a incentive system based on publishing in peer-reviewed journals in your discipline and things like that. So um, you've got to do something pretty big to motivate people to do something different than that. You know, huge amounts of money would be one thing. Maybe, well, another example I was thinking as you were talking about your question is what happened in World War II. A bunch of scientists brought, came together to try to solve the problems of fighting the war and beating the enemy. Uh, for instance, the whole field of operations research was developed by a bunch of mathematicians and physicists and others who were trying to help the war effort uh, and did a pretty good job of that in working in ways that were very different from the traditional academic ways. So, you know, maybe one way to do it is if you can convince people that this is like a war. I think there are people who've tried to make that case about climate change and I think there's some merit to that argument. So if you could really mobilize our, our whole country or our, our world on the conviction that climate change is a war and we've got to mobilize everything we can to, to deal with it, um, maybe that would help. Uh, I don't think it's easy and I guess I would say that the language of the five supermind types plus whatever other new ones become invented I think that's a way of figuring out more precisely how to organize an effort like what you described. Let's, let's take two more questions and then wrap. We have a question from YouTube, and this is also a question that one of the audience members asked me last night and wanted me to, to ask you this morning, is you've talked obviously a lot about intelligence and smart, everything from artificial intelligence, social intelligence, of course there's emotional intelligence, just to name a few. How do you define intelligence for the context of this conversation in your talk last night? Okay, good question. Um, I kind of answer that in the first chapter of the book. Um, the um, uh, intelligence is a very difficult word to define. Lots of people have different definitions. Um, uh, I quote some specific examples in the book, but if I have to give a definition, I give a very general one, which is I define intelligence as the ability to achieve goals. That's very broad. Some people would say that includes lots of things other than intelligence, but I think it's a useful place to start because you can, use, you can talk then about both specialized intelligence and general intelligence as I did last night. So you could say if someone is really good at repairing Honda ca cars, they have a kind of specialized intelligence for Honda car repair. Uh, the, what we often mean when we say a person is intelligent, though, is general intelligence. We mean the person has the ability to do lots of different things, they, or to learn to do lots of different things. Um, even if you have that ability, you, you may, even a really smart person wouldn't be very good at repairing Honda cars unless they had some experience with that particular task. But if you wanted somebody to figure out quickly how to repair Honda cars, you'd be better off to pick a high IQ person than a low IQ person. And IQ tests do measure this general intelligence. Um, so the advantage of that very broad definition of intelligence as the ability to achieve goals is that it lets you think about all the other questions about in, uh, collective intelligence like the different supermind types and so forth in a very flexible way to apply to lots of different things. Does that make sense? Yeah, one more. Uh, actually, I think he should have a chance before we quit too, but let, you can do her and then one more. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question about your definition of ecosystem and I was sort of thinking about the you know, Darwinian survival of the fittest definition and I always understood that to be, you know, more 
uh, something about uh, genetic evolution within an individual species, but less so um, relating to, you know, multi-species communities. And from a complex adaptive systems approach, uh, an ecosystem would, you know, the, the number of interdependent relationships within the ecosystem would define its longevity and health and stability. So uh, I'm wondering if you could actually consider uh, decision making in that sense as being sort of a, a collective adaptive response to flux between stasis and change in a complex adaptive system. So it's going to take me a minute to process that question. Uh, you're not a biologist by any chance, are you? Well, I'm a biology lover and <laughs> someone interested in complex adaptive systems. And this is coming from a talk by Jennifer Dunn at Santa Fe Institute on how to define uh, ecosystems. And she did this beautiful graphic that talked about that uh, the interdependent relationships being what actually creates the stability and forms the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a new paradigm for thinking about ecosystems, but it occurred to me and I wanted to ask whether you thought that response to change, uh, which is what all the agents within the ecosystem would be doing at any given moment is responding to the flux, um, could be considered decision-making of a sort. Uh, the short answer to that last question, I think, is yes. Certainly could be considered decision-making of a sort. Um, uh, it's worth saying that the five different types of superminds, I used words that have other meanings in other contexts. So the definition I gave of ecosystem is not exactly the same as the definition that biologists use for ecosystem. I don't remember the exact differences now, but I have some footnotes, I think, about it in my book. Um, and the description you just gave of, of an ecosystem where there's complex interdependencies among many different parts, I think is probably closer to the biological definition of ecosystem than the, the formal sense in which I was using it in my taxonomy of five. Um, uh, because you talk about interdependencies, not just competition. I just meant ecosystem as a place where is basically brute force and survival that determines things. Real ecosystems, of course, have lots of other kinds of relationships, mutualism and so forth. Uh, I think f in my framework, probably I would try to analyze those other kinds of relationships as more like a community where there are, in some sense, things you could interpret as norms about who eats whom and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but I, th I think that, does that answer your question? By the way, thank you for these talks. Uh, as I listened to this wonderful discussion, I was struck with a couple things that, for instance, in the days of the uh, horseless carriage to today's automobile, one of the things that changed were the boundaries of discourse as to what people bought. If I didn't care, when I got my first horseless carriage, whether or not there was something to keep dirt out of my face because I was traveling 15 to 20 miles an hour. But by the time I was traveling 45 miles an hour, it was life-threatening. Okay, those changes in boundary, I want to take back that thought and now apply it to the digital ecology of our time. Our digital ecology 25 years ago basically ignored issues of personal information because it was all just information and it was a monstrously difficult thing to get the information from point A to point B. And I, I can tell you coming out of the engineering community, our whole concern was how do you get it there accurately and if, it, if there's a mistake, how do you fix it? Okay, that was, that was the birth of the internet. Now, when we have elections that are being rigged because of the personal information that's being sieved from multiple strange entities which most of us would never have imagined in 1995. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, accumulating profiles of us that are uncanny in, in what they know about us. Now we're looking at a time when 
we may well need to redefine the boundaries of the entities that are allowed in the digital ecology. And I suspect, and I'd like your, your thoughts on the matter, that this may be one of the major points of concern going forth through all of the various kinds of mechanisms in the evolving 21st century world that we live in. Yeah, if, uh, if, if I understand what you're saying, I completely agree with it. Uh, but essentially, as we develop new technologies or new forms of supermind or all these kinds of things, we're going to find that they don't always work the way we think they will or the way we hope they will. And that as we use them, as they become more and more widely used in ways we didn't always anticipate, we often see problems that we should try to fix. Um, uh, you know, when you're going 40 miles an hour, it turns out you need a windshield or something like that. When you're making it instant, free, and uh, really easy to send information anywhere on the planet, then some kinds of information get exchanged that maybe you're not too happy about, like fake news. So uh, we need to figure out ways of dealing with those things. So uh, there was no need to have speed limits on, on roads when all you had was horses, right? But when you've got V8 engines, you need some speed limits. Uh, speed limits. Right. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully our superminds, our communities, our democratically elected governments, et cetera, will kind of recognize the problems and come up with good solutions, good ways of dealing with them. Uh, I don't think we can expect that that will always happen promptly and effectively, but I think it is reasonable to expect that it will eventually happen more or less okay. Uh, it may not always, but I think it's a reasonable expectation. Um, so we probably should have new laws or regulations or cultural norms about these things. The particular example you gave of personal data being widely available, uh, I've said for at least a decade or two that one plausible thing to explore, I think, in fact, maybe this is in my book, I can't remember, uh, one plausible thing to explore would be to say that when information is generated by some interaction between two people or two entities, like a person and a company, both parties own the information that is produced. And either party needs the consent of the other party to distribute it further. And often, that consent will be um, uh, obtained through some kind of financial transaction. Either you pay me some money to use the data you generated when you interacted with me, or you give me some other free service to do that. But it's a legal agreement, and it's enforceable, and I have rights. Uh, uh, one potential risk of that is that you'll have all these you know, impenetrable 20-page terms of uses that we all agree to when we click yes. Um, that's not a very good solution, because we don't really know what we agreed to. Uh, by the way, that's the only kind of contract I'd never read, uh, which is stupid, but that's kind of what I do. Uh, I think what, one thing we need is some trusted authority, whether it's a government or some kind of nonprofit, that will determine a set of standard agreements. You know, you know that if you go on this site, this site and it has terms of use number A1, you know that that's safe because people have said that's the standard one and your rights are protected. You don't have to know all the legalese, you just know that's a good one. If it's got some other terms of use that's not even categorized or that is Q19, uh, then you would think really hard before you agree to do anything on this site. So I think things like that, some of those would be laws like in fact, just applying, well, you probably do need a legal change to say that I own the data that I create on your site, or I'm a co-owner of it. I think you can do a contract like that. Maybe. Maybe. 
Right. So it may be something like that. I, I, I don't know, but. <laughs> Actually, just one, one other quick comment. I think what we're going through here is equivalent to what happened when we moved from hunting and gathering societies, it's what something an anthropologist would know about, from hunting and gathering societies to agrarian societies. My understanding, in fact, some of you may have seen the things of the Indian chief who says, what does it mean to own land? That's a silly idea. How could anyone own the land? You know, we all roam freely over this land. It's a, you know, public thing. Uh, and yet, in agrarian societies, who owns the land is a very big deal. And we had to evolve whole legal systems and so forth for enforcing land ownership. I think we're in the early stages of something similar with information ownership. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us here in the Eric Dobkin boardroom at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe for an engaging uh, conversation. And please join me in thanking Professor Thomas Malone for a fabulous conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you for great questions, too. This was a great conversation from my point of view. <laughs>